Welcome to the Atheist in Recovery podcast, where we talk about finding hope in recovery. And now your host, Dr. Adina Silvestri. Hello, Atheists in Recovery land, and welcome to episode 47 of the Atheists in Recovery podcast. And I'm excited to introduce you to my next guest. We are talking with the author of Cold Turkey, How to Quit Drinking by Not Drinking. And before I get into the show, I just want to let you know that I always condone safely quitting drinking, right? right? So always get professional help. Talk to your medical provider. I don't want you to ever quit without talking to to your support system and to medical professionals. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Let's talk about our episode today, how to quit drinking by not drinking. And so we have on today Mishka Shibali, and he is going to talk to us about how to quit drinking without AA, uh, the tools he's cultivated along his 10-year road to sobriety, and why being a dick aka telling himself some hard truths, helped him to find the courage to begin a path to sobriety. And he does it on his own terms. And you guys know that I am all about individualized recovery. And so sort of stress testing the swear words already, but this episode contains language that is not suitable for children. And those offended by swear words, uh, I encourage you though to, if possible, merely filter it out because I do believe that this content is really valid and I really like what he has to say. Under a guess. Mishka Shubali. Mishka is the author of seven best selling Kindle singles and a memoir. I swear I'll make it up to you. He has traveled the world as a songwriter, storyteller, and comedian, sharing the stage with artists like Doug Stanhope, Richard Price, Ron White, and Lydia Lunch. In 2001, he survived a shipwreck. And in 2017, he was a clue on Jeopardy, which we talk about. (laughs) When not writing, recording, or touring, he teaches nonfiction at the Yale Writers Workshop. In the spring of 2020, he celebrated 11 years sober. All right, guys, let's get this party started. Mishka Shibali, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I am really excited that you are here with us today. And I thought we would start with this random fact that I found about you, that you were a clue on Jeopardy in 2017. Let's start there. Yeah, it (laughs) caught me by as much surprise as it probably caught you. I was living in Atlanta at the time and my phone, you know, somebody texted me and they were like, dude, I'm at the gym and I swear I'm not imagining this. I think you were a clue on Jeopardy. And I was like, nah, that's no, you know, like. Uh, you should probably drink more, maybe get some, you know, electrolytes and, you know, that's not happening. And then maybe an hour later, my phone went so nuts that I thought that like I'd gotten it wet and the battery was melting down or something because I just got so many messages. But I never got to see it live because I don't think I had a TV at the time. But yeah, I was uh, I was a clue on Jeopardy. And it was a thousand dollar question and the and uh, the person got it right, too. Awesome. It had to do with, so I, I had a string of, you know, successful stories published with Amazon and I was running with my editor one day and he was, you know, I was like, oh, you know, we should do a collection and I would love for you to write the forward. And he was like, I'll do it, but you know, you should shoot for the moon. You should, uh, you should email Jeff Bezos and see if he'll write it. Wow. And then, you know, when my next, I like went out for a run couple months later and my next story like went to number one and I came in and I had that like runner's high and I was like fuck it I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna email Jeff Bezos and I emailed him and it was just one of those things that I you know you send out in the universe and that you you have no expect of you know expectation of hearing back and he emailed back like an hour later and was like uh hey big fan yeah I'd love to do it (laughs) wow So that, that was a, that was a bizarre experience. And, and the forward that he wrote is totally beautiful. It's, it was like really touching. It was super cool. Wow. And where do I find that forward? The uh, it's in the digital collection that's available on Amazon. That is so cool. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about your spiritual background from childhood my family is all sort of staunch Roman Catholic, and most of them are pretty conservative. 
Uh, my mom comes from a family of 17 children, northern Saskatchewan. She was the second of 17. And, you know, most of my family still lives in like rural Canada and they're roughnecks, they're rednecks, they're hillbillies, you know, <laughs> farmers, ranchers. They work on the oil rigs, work in the oil fields. And I love them all terribly. Mm. However, my mom was sort of the black sheep of her family. So, you know, though her family and sort of most of my extended family is deeply Catholic, we only got the sort of like the secondhand smoke of religion, which is to say that I feel guilty about fucking everything, but there's no, there's no belief system tied to it, you know? And, you know, we would go to church like once a year, go to midnight mass or whatever. And, and I grew up in a pretty Christian, pretty Catholic community, mm -hmm. but I, rem I remember distinctly, we left Canada when I was eight and it was, bef it was quite a bit before that. So I was probably like five or six. And I remember it was the summertime. And I was wearing my little green running shorts and like nothing else. I think I had my soccer ball or maybe my skateboard with me. I walked out into the driveway. I looked up into the sky and I thought, nah, there's nothing up there. It's just clouds, you know, and that's it. You know, so I, I guess I'm, I'm not really... I'm not really atheist anymore. I'm anti-theist, but mm -hmm. you know, for, I guess it's an important distinction to me that I, there was no like crisis of conscience. You know, I didn't see like see a, a family member die in a horrible way or something like that. And then I was like, there is no God. It was just, you know, there's no exclamation point for, for me. There was just, there, there's no God, you know, and yes. And, you know, and, and what after that, you know, <laughs> And we will address all of that in the podcast today. I'm kidding. Awesome. We, don't have, we don't have enough time. So. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're anti-theist and, and I'm sure that that had an impact on your recovery. And so I'm wondering if you can now talk a little about the book. So finding sobriety without AA. Yeah. You know, I drank hard for a long time. I quit drinking when I was 32. Yesterday was actually my 11 year sobriety anniversary. And Congrats. thank you. One of the things that I struggled with was that growing up, there was, you know, there was this dichotomy that there was like the bad people who drank and partied and listened to Guns N' Roses and like had a good fun time with their lives. And then there were like the good people who didn't drink and went to church and were uptight and didn't curse and like went to bed at 8 p.m. and you know had these sort of like boring constricted lives you know mm -hmm. so I, I understood very early on that at some point in my life I was gonna have to quit drinking forever I mean I think I was 17 when I identified that I was an alcoholic and quit drinking a short 15 years later <laughs> but part of you know I mean and I'm you know I'm honest about this in cold turkey you know, where I said I was willing to endure the worsening horrors of my own alcoholism just to avoid going to AA. And part of why I didn't want to go to AA was, was the God shit, you know? And mm -hmm. to me, it, it felt like door-to-door -door salesman techniques, you know, that they're going to like get the door open with this higher power shit. And that, but then it's very quickly turns into God and God being a man, a straight man, mm -hmm. a white man, and, you know, a, you know, sort of like uh, Dick Cheney with a long flowing beard, you know, and <laughs> if I had a God, that is not who it would be. So I knew that when I got sober, it had to be without AA because I just, I'd lived a godless life for a long time. And I knew that that was, that was the way forward for me. The, the, the problem in my life was not the absence of God. It was the presence of alcohol. And so I just, I just did it my own way. I, I did it, you know, the only way that I knew how to, to get sober and to stay sober, you know, and then being sober outside of AA without any kind of theistic belief has sort of helped me evolve over the years. And, you know, interrogating my beliefs has, you know, has actually helped me a lot to develop, I guess, my relationship with the world in the absence of God or spirituality or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. I just, as a being hundred percent honest, I have, I have to reluctantly identify now as agnostic and no longer atheist. I'm like anti-theist agnostic because a couple of years ago I smoked DMT and, uh, 
I thought it was, you know, I went into it with no preparation and saw some things there that I can't explain. You can't unsee. Yeah. And so I, I like came out of this trip, you know, feeling like I'd been turned reluctantly against my will into some like, you know, 50 year old white dude with a ponytail and an arrowhead, you know, pendant and Warachi sandals that like, oh, we're all connected by this life force, man. <laughs> and I don't want to believe that at all. But I can no longer say comfortably that I'm an atheist. And I just have to say, I recognize how puny I am in the universe and that I can't, I can't say there is, there is a God or there is no God. However, I am anti-theist in that I don't think that the concept of God serves humanity. I don't think it helps us. I think it hurts us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that we could probably have a whole other episode about smoking DMT. <laughs> so let's talk now about the book Cold Turkey. So you're narrating it. And I love how you, in the beginning, sort of give us the Mishka Smackdown where you tell us to stop bullshitting. So, th so then if that doesn't turn you off and you keep listening, which you should, you, you're like this, this roommate that is walking alongside us. You're like this good angel on our shoulder and the hardness softens a bit. So, so you don't take a prescriptive approach at all, which is, which is important to note. Yeah. I mean, I think part of being, you know, being atheist or being agnostic is recognizing how little you know. And I fucking hate Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz and any Dr. Drew, any doctor on TV, unless there are just an actor playing a doctor in a sitcom. I think it's bullshit. You know, it's like this cult of personality, you know, and it's in, in no way, are they serving people? Are they serving the greater good? You know, I mean, it's, you know, Dr. Phil has, has lost his license to give, I guess he's lost, he had some, I can't remember exactly what it was, but he had been given a degree from some school and then they sort of took it away from him. So now guests on his show have to sign a waiver saying that they're not receiving input from a doctor, but just advice from a, a TV personality. And it's been proven that Dr. Oz regularly like tells people to do things that go against medical advice where he's just lining his pockets, you know? So I wanted to say, you want, want to come to it clearly and say, listen, I, the only authority that I have here is my own. My sole source of authority on this subject is my own journey, you know, and I, I don't have any certificate from any school or anything like that to say why you should listen to me. There's no money back guarantee. I'm, it's just, I just care about this. I just give a shit, you know, that like quitting drinking radically transformed my life. And that has been the thing that's made the new life that I have possible. And if people don't want to quit drinking, then fucking game on, you know, have a good time. But if you're miserable with your drinking, I want to give, to give you all the tools that I've developed from over 10 years of sobriety to give you the means of controlling your life, of getting better on your own and on your own terms. And part of that is, yeah, it's being a dick. You know, I, I had to like really be a dick to myself and just say, you know, you, you got to fucking knock this off. You got to, you have to change your mind. So hopefully it's helpful to have that externalized and that it's not a huge turnoff for people to have some stranger who doesn't know you and doesn't know your life and your problems to tell you to like stop the bullshit. But I, yeah. I think that's the part that that's the one part that no one has objected to. People have objected to everything else, but not the drop the bullshit part. I like the drop the bullshit part. I do that in therapy only in a much nicer way. <laughs> Well, that's the other thing is I think therapists <laughs> want to say that probably every session and you can't. And I, I can, so I did. <laughs> so I want to, there are a couple steps in the book. I think there are four steps and we won't be going over them in the podcast, but I do want to talk about some of the key takeaways that I really liked. One is you tell the listeners, and this is an audio book, by the way, um, you tell the listeners to stay, stay sober for 30 days. Tell me about that. Why 30 days? And, and then what happens after 30 days? <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe the spoiler alert here. I try to do the same thing in the audiobook that I found to be so reprehensible in 
AA with the higher power God switch, mm -hmm. you know, which is to tell somebody you're going to stop drinking now and forever. They're like, fuck that. No, no way. But if you just get the thin edge of the wedge in there to just say, listen, you're just, you're going to promise to me now you're going to do 30 days. Anyone can do 30 days. Everyone can do 30 days. You're, it's just, you're just taking a month off, you know, and that's something that exists that, that's like sort of fairly like even celebrated in the drinking world is, you know, dry January or sober October or, you mm. know, basically taking a month off. And if you love drinking, if you want to drink happily for the rest of your life, you should take a month off every year. You know, that is, I think that's a great way to, to mitigate the harmful effects of alcohol. You know, I, I try to just tell people, listen, you're just going to take a month off. So I sort of like making it bite size sobriety. But I think 30 days is long enough where people weather the worst physical withdrawal. And it's long enough that they see a reversal where after 30 days, your nausea goes away, your headaches go away, you, you're sleeping better, you feel physically stronger, your brain is clearer. And a lot of people, you know, when we quit drinking, you find like, oh, I just lost 15 pounds by doing nothing, you know, mm. or, oh, my face looks better for some reason. Or, you know, uh, when I quit drinking, I got younger. <laughs> like, you know, and I, or people's eyes seem to get bigger because their, their faces are less inflamed, you know? Yeah. So in that first 30 days, I feel like you see, you get a real good look at what it's staying sober long enough to get a good look at what living sober looks like. Mm -hmm. And then you just keep going. You just keep doing it. You just, just, okay, I've had, you know, a month of good days and now I'm just going to have another month, you know, mm -hmm. if the opportunity is provided, I would like to do another audio book like this. That's. I don't know, colder turkey, <laughs> cold turkeyer, you know, which is to say how to manage the first six months, how to manage the first year, how to manage it after the pink cloud days are gone, you know, after you've been sober for 18 months and then you're like, oh, well, I'm fucking just sober all the time now because your body does sort of reset and recalibrate and it becomes, a, you know, the new normal to you. Yeah. You know, and there's still challenges. 11 years sober, like I still every once in a while just you just wake up and you're like, Oh my God, I just, I, I want to drink a gallon of the worst tequila. And like, I never drank tequila. <laughs> you know, I hated tequila, <laughs> but for some reason you just wake up and you just wait and it goes away. <laughs> and then you, you just get, wait. And then you get up and you fucking go running and like clean out the cat box and do what you have to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So we wait the 30 days. Uh, and we see what a life without booze is like. And for some people, this is our love of, this is the love of our life, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's the, it's the one thing that's been this, this constant in our world. And so it's, you know, and the people that, that see me in my private practice tell me like, it's, I can't imagine a life without it, you know? And so we get some distance from it. I wept when I quit <laughs> drinking. I just cried and cried and cried. I grieved for, yeah. you know, it was like losing the, you know, the love of my life. It was like losing my best friend. It was like losing, it was sort of like losing my mother in that it was like, I felt like I'd only ever gotten unconditional love from alcohol. You know, it was yeah. always there to listen to me and to comfort me. And, um, it helped me like keep myself company. So yeah, I mean, that shit is absolutely real. I, I, I grieved for it. I still do sometimes, you know, I mean, and also my life is, you know, 110% unquestionably better without it. You know, we talk about toxic relationships. Alcohol is the fucking OG toxic, toxic relationship. I like that. Yes. The OG toxic relationship. And so we get some space from alcohol during these 30 days. What are some things that we should be looking for after the 30 days? You know, what happens next? In the book, you talk about, which this is, I love this. You talk about paying your damn taxes. <laughs> yeah. For me, I don't think that alcoholism was my sort of, was my original problem. 
my drinking was an expression of my problems and the problems were that you know i'd lived through a lot of trauma and i you know and i struggle and even without the trauma i struggle with you know depression and anxiety and self-loathing and and loathing of other people so you know there was a lot there and when you remove that or you know so drinking was sort of a uh, like a pressure valve for me you know where i was able to sort of release that pressure and then when i you know that was taken away i had to find other ways of dealing with that I, uh, I'm an outspoken proponent for crying. You know, I, uh, Me too. lost a friend last week, uh, ultra runner, David Clark, who was like mm. probably 48 and he was, he was a huge, you know, sobriety recovery success story. A dude lost 150 pounds and became a, you know, an elite ultra runner. He was a dear I'm friend. Sorry. I love him. I'll love him for the rest of my life, you know, and mm-hmm. I, so I just, I put my shades on and I go run and I go cry on the run and you got to run super early in the morning in Phoenix, uh, before it gets too hot and you got dark sunglasses, people can't tell you're crying. So then you can just run around and cry in public. And I feel so much fucking better from Mm. just feeling my damn feelings, you know, and crying about Dave, you know, it's the you know, you can try to bottle that shit up, but why would you, you know, it's like nature has provided us with, with a perfect, and it's not even like a head trick or something. It's energy made matter, right? You take that negative energy, that grief, that sadness, that frustration, and you turn it into a physical thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's tears are miraculous, man. You just, you know, cry as much as you can. (laughs) <laughs> just get the shit out, you know, just get the shit out. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and for me too, you know, with, you know, with anger, with the anger that I feel, you know, I feel like part of, at times it feels like the cost of admission for living in, uh, you know, sort of contemporary society is that no one's allowed to get angry. You know, mm-hmm. there's the, you know, public freak out, you know, subreddit on Reddit, you know, of people like losing their shit in public. And it's like, we're not allowed to get angry, but, but everyone gets angry. We all get angry yes. for yes. for reasons good and bad. And man, when cops are murdering unarmed black people in the streets, a lot of shit to be mm-hmm. angry about, you know? So mm-hmm. you can poison yourself with anger or you can use that to fuel something positive, you know? And for me, you know, again, that's that's running. You know, if if I'm running and I feel like I'm out of gas, then I just think about like, what am I angry about this week? What's bothering me? you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, you'll find you can crank out a couple extra miles or, you know, I have a heavy bag out in the yard. I, so I, you know, I try not to get angry with my friends and family and people like that. But then when I put my gloves on, that's when I feel it. That's when I allow mm-hmm. myself to process it and you, you turn it into a great workout. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the best, most productive thing I think you can do with it. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of feelings, as you probably already know. But um, (laughs) yeah, you have to feel the feelings. And so after these 30 days, there are probably going to be some feelings that are coming up that might seem like you should bury them. But you're saying, no, (laughs) get them out. Yeah. Go for a run. Do the exact opposite of bury them, you know. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, too, is the largest part of the word emotion is motion, which is to say that feelings are temporary, they're transitory by nature. Happiness is fleeting, sadness is fleeting, anger is fleeting. So if something happens, you stub your toe or something like that, or somebody somebody keys your car, right? Don't try not to get angry. Instead, mm-hmm. just sit there and get as angry as possible and try to hold on to it for as long as you can. And those two things of feeling the feeling and then trying to hold on to it, trying to preserve it, it's impossible. The only way to hold on to anger forever is to bury it. But if Mm. you try to feel it and try, you know, after, after 15, 20 minutes, you know, max, 
you know, you'll be like, ah, oh, fuck it. it. It, they just keyed my car. It, it, it doesn't matter. You know, it's a $200 deductible through insurance or how fucking lucky am I to even have a car worth keying or, mm. uh, you know what I did, uh, I did park in that handicapped spot. So maybe that's on me. Uh, all right. Yeah. It's a lesson, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I, I, you know, I try to just feel it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And then also you could ask yourself, is this feeling needed? Like, should I be feeling this way? <laughs> you know, like yeah. emotions, especially anger, you know, they're, they're there for a reason. They're, we need to know what, what's going on beneath it. So one, one of the things that I, I didn't put in the book that I, I wish I had put in the book. Um, and that if there's another version, I will put in there. Colder. Yes. Turkey. Coldest Turkey is fun should be an integral part of every recovery program. Mm -hmm. You know, my cat in the morning, when I, I let her out into the yard, you know, I open the door so she can go out and she won't go out. She looks at me because she's like, no, I'm not going out. We're going out. And she's right. You know, so what she wants is she wants us to go out in the yard together and she wants me to chase her around and then to let her chase me a little bit. And she wants to have fun. So it's, it's a really important, I mean, I, I think I would be mortally embarrassed if I saw, you know, if, if people were, if there was some live feed of like grown ass man, 43 years old, chasing his cat around the yard. But that's an integral part of not just re of recovery, but like of being a fucking human being, man. You know, mm. like, God forbid we enjoy this ride a little bit, you know? And, mm. it, and it doesn't have to be getting hammered. It doesn't have to be hookers and blow. It doesn't have to be tailgating, you know, some sporting event. It doesn't have to be all capital letters screaming fun. It can just be a little bit of fun. It can just be chasing your cat around the yard. But I, I try to do... I have that on my job list every day. Mm -hmm. Have fun. So, Mishka, as we kind of wrap up here, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what parts of yourself do you feel like are different before sobriety and, and, and now? I like to think that I'm more patient now uh, with myself and with other people. It's funny now because I feel like, you know, sober, I require less forgiveness from other people in my life. Mm -hmm. But... I have a better relationship with forgiveness. I'm able to, I'm able to forgive myself more and able to forgive other people more. You know, when I was a kid, it was always like the punks versus the hippies. And I was firmly in the, in the, you know, in the punk category, but I'm finding out later in life that I love love, that love is super important and you should tell people when you love them. Mm. I did, I did a podcast with a, a guy about art the other day. And, you know, we were talking about, is there something in the universe or is it just nothing? You know, and I said, well, I'm, I'm sort of a, a nihilist, which, you know, which is to say that I don't think there's any intrinsic order or purpose to the universe. I think the only meaning that we get out of our lives is the meaning that we stitch into it. And the only meaning that I've been able to find the, or the best way to bring meaning to my own life is to feel love, to express love, to make shit, to write songs, to build guitars, to, mm -hmm. you know, to just, to, to write dick jokes, to, to make stuff, to create stuff and to connect with other people. And I think if I said that 12 years ago, 2008 Mishka would have been like, get the fuck out of here with that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 2008 Mishka wouldn't be buying it. Yeah. yeah. Not at all. Yeah. Okay. Well, any, any final words for the atheist and recovery community as we wrap up today? I, I mean, I, I would say just embrace, don't fight the duality of human nature, but embrace the duality of, of human nature. You know, that there is a lot in recovery that feels hypocritical, but I think there's actually truth there, you know, which is to say that when you're trying to get better, you have to be hard on yourself. You have to be that own internal voice saying, drop the bullshit, you know? So you do have to be hard on yourself. You also have to be gentle to yourself. You have to be generous towards yourself, you know? So it's, it's balancing those two things. They don't cancel each other out. They work in tandem, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. How can we best find you and the awesome book, Cold Turkey on Audible? 
the best thing about being Mishka Shabali is that uh, I'm like uh, I'm like the Highlander. There there can be only one. Um, I'm the only Mishka Shabali out there. So if you plug my name into Audible, that will call up uh, Cold Turkey and all the other audio books that I have there. And if you search my name on Amazon, that will kick up all my other writing there, my music. I'm at Mishka Shabali on Twitter and Instagram. I think I'm facebook.com slash Mishka Shabali. I'm the only one out there. I'm really easy to find on the platform of your choice. <laughs> Great. All right, Mishka. Well, thank you so much for being on today. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Atheists in Recovery podcast. For more great info and to stay up to date, head over to atheistsinrecovery.com.